Hello everyone. Well, today we'll be looking at the nomadic tribes uh, of the Eurasian steppe grasslands. And uh, they're called the Scythians by the ancient authors. And the reason for that is because the tribe themselves did not leave us uh, any records of themselves. Therefore, uh, we must rely on the likes of Herodotus, who was a great ancient traveler back in the 5th century BC and uh, traveled to the uh, north shore of the Black Sea and reached what today is Edessa and uh, observed the tribes uh, firsthand and also relied, of course, on uh, the information from others. He left us uh, some uh, very valuable material and also there was the so-called uh, pseudo Hippocrates, uh, who was another traveler and uh, he was medically inclined and therefore often he's called Hippocrates but because it's probably not Hippocrates himself who was a younger contemporary of Herodotus um, they will call him pseudo Hippocrates. Um, thus to Scythians we go. Um, they belong to the first millennium BC and uh, at the time, they were the most terrifying military force, uh, not only in the area where they stand, but they also will expand into Persia. They will fight the Medes, they will fight the Parthians, uh, they will sweep through Palestine, and uh, finally the Egyptians will pay them off to leave. The, uh, they were very well known throughout the, uh, all these lands for their extraordinary bravery, and their incredible skill with the horseback riding. Uh, and as I said, because uh, they had no written language, we will rely on the ancient um, sources. Now, they belong to uh, the um, Indo-European group of uh, languages, which uh, in itself is um, a bit of a question mark, but it seems that the linguists, the scholars of language, have by now pretty much agreed that the Indo-European group originated between uh, somewhere here, between uh, the Black Sea and the Caspian, right here, and then spread, spread east, spread west, and all of this happened about 6,000 years ago. So all these lands will possess the elements of Indo-European language including what we'll later know as the Scythians. But then, uh, we, we're talking here in terms of thousands of years, it seems likely that in the early first millennium BC, the tribes that will inhabit the, uh, the region of southern Siberia, the Altai Mountains, will then migrate back to the area of origin to the area of the Pontic Steppe, it is called, and that is the northern shore of the Black Sea, also the area of the Kuban, which is between the Black Sea and the Caspian Sea, uh, and will occupy all this land, which is today Ukraine, uh, southern Russia, Kazakhstan, and southern Siberia. So all of this area will be occupied by the Scythian tribes, it's hard to tell um, one tribe from another, ultimately, because many tribes will have different names, but they are all nomadic tribes. And by virtue of their peregrinations, they will come in contact with one another, they will intermarry, they will assume some characteristics of other tribes, and therefore um, the ancients will call all of them the Scythians, which is understandable because the ancient sedentary societies such as Mesopotamia, Persia, Egypt, um, societies in Palestine. Uh, to them, uh, these tribes that um, existed thousands of miles away all uh, acquired the generic name of the Scythians, and so was with the Greeks as well. Here is a larger picture of the um, uh, Eurasian steppe or grasslands, because uh, all this area, it was like... Um, a sea of grass and very conducive to peregrination, very conducive to uh, nomadic, um, nomadic way of life. 
uh, as you see, this is um, this is uh, the uh, the Altai Mountains, and then the Scythians will then extend into Central Europe. So, and that's uh, that's about four thousand miles. This is a closer picture. We will be looking at them here, as I said, in the Altai Mountains right here. Then this is Kazakhstan here, to the east of the Caspian Sea but also between uh, the Black Sea and the Caspian Sea in the Kuban right here and in today's Ukraine. All these areas were occupied by the Scythians for very many years. Uh, here's another picture uh, of, um, of this Euro-Asian plain, the Euro-Asian steppe it's called in Russian or grasslands. And again, they're extending all these thousands of miles from the Altai Mountains to the Hungarian Plain right here, the Black Sea, the Caspian Sea. Uh, as I said, they were, not, they were not a united people. There were a number of tribes. They were divided into different confederations, so to speak, such as the Sakas of southeastern Iran, then the Amardi, the Parnis, all sorts of tribes, but these tribes, again, were all nomadic tribes, and they all have very similar characteristics. They, uh, the people themselves, as you see, had for neighbors the Iranic people of the south, and, uh, and as such, have much in common with them as well. Um, here's still another, and the step right here, this is, these are the grasslands, then here more of a deciduous forest, and then the taiga is in the north. But this area here is just an open sea, literally, and very easy to travel. And in a way, because of the climaxing conditions and also agricultural conditions, and they were pastoral people, these uh, uh, the Scythians, the the farther west you go, the better are the conditions, and therefore that was forever a magnet. And, uh, and then many hundreds of years later, we will look at the Mongolians who will follow the Scythes the same way and will invade uh, what at the time will already be Russia. At this point, there is no such thing as Russia or Ukraine or Kazakhstan. There are no borders, and there are all these nomads traveling up and down. Here we are, the 7th, uh, 6th uh, centuries were the height of Scythian uh, hegemony and this is the time when they in fact traveled south and engaged the Medians, the uh, Parthians that uh, will become the uh, part of the Persian Empire and then as you see went through Palestine into Egypt and then Egypt bought them off and off they went back into their lands. These are the areas of today's Ukraine, and this here is the Kuban that uh, is uh, at the hills of the Caucasian Mountains. And uh, in the western part of uh, Scythian dwellings, and uh, that is the part that Herodotus writes mostly about, because Herodotus himself came and stayed, as I said, in present-day Odessa and could observe them firsthand. The northern shores of the Black Sea at that time, at the time of the Herodotus, which is 5th century BC, were populated by the Greeks. There were many, many sedentary Greek colonies that uh, originated back in the 8th, 7th century BC, and the Scythians themselves, even though nomadic, by the time of the 5th century, often some of them settled down not far from the Greeks, and an interaction took place, obviously. And the, in the tremendous art of the Scythians that we'll look at in this lecture, uh, a number of the pieces will be produced by the Greek masters for the Scythian elite. And they are easy to tell because they're redolent with the Greek um, sensitivity to the human element, but also their sensitivity to uh, human expression and also, of course, their skill in their craft. The uh, rivers that we see here will play uh, a great role in uh, the early Russian history. And as you see, one of the most important rivers is the Dnieper, right here. flows out of the Ladoga Lake. But also the Don, which is a tributary of the Dnieper, 
right there. And then the Volga, the Volga that part of it takes place in the Ural Mountains and then another part uh, comes over uh, the Don, which at this point is, it has a different name, by the name of Oka. Another very important river will be the Danube, right there. But uh, the Danube flows through today's Hungary, and this is where the Scythians will uh, intermingle with the uh, future Celts, and that's how so many influences, in fact, of the Scythians appear to then penetrate into Western Europe. Uh, the majority of the Scythians were primarily archers, and the armed bands were mostly cavalry. And they were incredible archers, and uh, they were archers at the time when other armies depended mostly on foot soldiers and chariots, whereas the Scythians did not uh, have chariots and did not have foot soldiers, certainly not originally, not until perhaps they... Uh, um, they came in contact with the Greeks and then with the Persians, and in fact, they will be hired as mercenaries by all uh, those sedentary societies. Here is just one of the impressions of what uh, the grasslands look like, or what the steppe looks like. The homeland of the Scythians, the Eurasian steppe, um, a broad delta of grassland, and it extends about 6,000 miles from the Pacific uh, Ocean to the Hungarian plain. And uh, this is what I meant when I said that it looks like a sea, but a sea of grass rather than uh, uh, the actual sea. Here's another one, and uh, as you can imagine, without uh, any obstacles, as you see here, uh, a skilled mountain warrior could cover up to 50, 60 miles a day. So these people were extremely mobile. So the armed bands went first, then the wives and the children and uh, the uh, flocks of animals followed. Uh, this is uh, a recreation of this, of what this may have been like, and this is a description by the pseudo-Hippocrates that I told you uh, about, uh, about the Scythian caravans. They are called nomads because they have no houses and they live in wagons. Uh, the smallest of these wagons uh, are on four wheels, uh, as we see here. The larger have six wheels. And, uh, and then the tents are covered in felt and constructed like houses. In fact, some of them may have a couple of rooms or three rooms, the larger, the larger ones. And then they are drawn by two or three uh, uh, yoked uh, oxen. Uh, and in these uh, homes live uh, women and children while the men ride on horseback, followed by their sheep, cattle, horses. And uh, they essentially remain in one place so long as there is sufficient fodder for their animals. And when that's exhausted, they move on. And these are the descriptions. Needless to say, their life depends on their horses. And the relationship between a rider and a horse is symbiotic, uh, really. The, uh, the ancient Greeks' idea of a centaur perhaps came from there as well, when a rider and a horse become one. The question is, uh, and um, it is still unanswered, what came first? Was uh, driving first, such as the chariot, or riding? And it seems logical that riding would come first. However, the uh, there's so much evidence in favor of the driving as opposed to the riding, uh, but uh, in the end, we really don't know. Uh, again, it appears that the uh, area of the chariot, that the chariot again appeared in, uh, in that area of the Ural Mountains, and we're talking about thousands and thousands of years ago, and that area is indicated in purple. So, and here it is in red, and this is the map of the spread of the chariot. So it supposedly originated in the South Ural Mountains and then it spread throughout, as you see here. On the other hand, uh, the idea of riding a horse seems to go back also thousands and thousands of years. And uh, so, as I said, the question is unanswered. What came first? But in terms of waging war, the chariot came first, before cavalry. And while the Persians, for instance, and the Egyptians were still using the chariot, uh, the Scythians were mounted cavalry, even though they were not uh, 
organized as uh, the later mounted cavalry will be organized. Nevertheless, they very much had certain tactics as well and certain behavior in battle. Uh, one of the fascinating behaviors, in fact, was because they were not sedentary, because uh, they didn't have anything to fight for, they did not have cities. Uh, the, at some point, the uh, Persian king Darius, back in the 4th century, uh, attempted to invade uh, their lands, but they just wouldn't give him battle, because that was their strategy. They would, uh, they pretty much used the guerrilla tactics. They would attack his sidelines and then disappear, and then attack his sidelines or from the back and then disappear. And finally, Darius just had to leave because there was no one to fight with. Uh, and even though he, of course, proclaimed himself a victor, there was no victory because there was no confrontation. Uh, and the Scythians themselves, it is known from one of the uh, Greek writers that uh, they uh, pronounce the fact that they have nothing to defend. Uh, so therefore, they only fight with those they choose to fight. They do not fear an invader. But if an invader attacks their tumuli, attacks their tombs, then the invader will know how powerful they are. So that was important for them. And it is from these uh, tumuli, they're called kurgans in, uh, in Russian, that all this incredible richness comes from. And um, again, the horse is a most important element in a uh, nomadic lifestyle. And here too, we see horses. Um, the greatest collection of uh, Scythian artifacts uh, is in the Hermitage. Russia began exploration uh, of Siberia back in the uh, 16th, 17th century, and uh, certain artifacts uh, came, uh, came to light uh, that were fascinating. And uh, Peter the Great uh, was very interested in them and sent envoys to these other parts with a very definite task of uh, exploring uh, these uh, tumuli, these kurgane, and to bring back as much as possible. And as a result, uh, much of it was brought to St. Petersburg, which was also very newly built uh, by Peter the Great. And as a result, the collection is um, very rich. Uh, and the next in richness uh, is uh, the collection in Kiev. So those two museums are uh, the best if anyone is interested in seeing Skifian artifacts. Uh, here is an ophora which is done in silver and it is in the hermitage while the uh, body of the ophora exhibits bird life and tendrils and plants on, uh, on the shoulders. One sees a Scythian engagement with the horses and it is there that we see that they did have saddles right here. And uh, in the first instance, uh, this is from a book, uh, the two scenes from the um, uh, Chertamlik uh, Kurgan. And uh, in the first instance, uh, a man is hobbling a horse right there. And uh, the second instance, uh, which is very interesting, the horse is being trained to lie down. And it's possible that that was done for the purpose of mounting the horse. Sort of like camels go down in order for us to mount the camels. And if the horse is large, even though those horses were not as large as uh, some of the horses today, but nevertheless, it's much easier to mount a horse when it is um, when it kneels down. And this is what you see here. Uh, another image from the same vase. It, this is uh, a lassoed horse is being subdued, and you see here that the men are. We don't see the lassos, but their movements suggest that the horse is lassoed and. Uh, and being trained. Now, according to Herodotus, the Scythians had, as other people did, a whole pantheon of gods, and the most important were seven deities, to whom, uh, to all of whom he gives the equivalent of Greek names, essentially. Uh, a very important deity was a Scythian Hercules, uh, the progenitor of the race, and Ares, the all-important god of war. And for Scythians, war was second nature, so Ares would be important as Hercules was important as the progenitor of the race. At the head of the pantheon, however, was the goddess Hestia, or the flaming one. And she was the goddess of heat, fire, and the hearth. In um, the Greek pantheon, she essentially became the goddess of fire and the hearth. But uh, there were a multitude of roles that Scythians attached to her. She's the guardian of the king 
and his heart and because it's a mobile society without uh, religious structures, without permanent altars, it is the king's hearth that essentially became the altar, which was sacred, and the king was considered an intermediary between the people and the goddess. And another female goddess, which was also very important, was the so-called Aphrodite Urania, or also mistress of the beasts. And uh, here are two plaques, two gold plaques that we see, the Scythian plaques, all of it comes from the burials, and uh, this is uh, the horse frontlet that goes uh, down the nose, the horse nose, in gold, and uh, it belongs to about the 5th century BC, also in the Hermitage, and there you see a divine female whose legs become snakes, and then various other uh, tendrils, and who is standing straight facing directly at us, maybe the mistress of the beasts, and here too another gold plaque of a winged goddess. In this case this is in a known location somewhere in the Ukraine because uh, once uh, the rumor went uh, across the lands that thing, gold things that we found in these tumuli, in these hills, then as you can imagine there was a lot of grave robbery and many of these kurgans had been robbed before they were archaeologically investigated. And once, uh, uh, once it's robbed, then you cannot place a certain object with a certain kurgan, and therefore it just becomes as an art object. But it, does, uh, it is a female, and a female that, uh, whose feet and arms uh, may convey a flame, uh, which uh, would be appropriate for Hestia. Uh, here's still more of these incredible gold plaques. Uh, again, the mistress of the beast here. This is a mirror, the other side of a mirror. And uh, the mistress of the beast in this case is surrounded by members of the animal kingdom and displays her role essentially as supporting life on earth as being a most important goddess. And her kinship with animal totems shows that she is a driving force in fertility, in procreation, extremely important well, for all societies, but the societies especially where women died in childbirth, uh, infants died in child mortality, infant mortality, and men died in war, procreation was extremely uh, important. On each side of her are leopards and then there are lions, and these animals link the Scythian goddess with all the goddesses from other ancient societies such as Sikment, uh, Lilith, Sibel, Anahit, whether Persian or Syrian or even down to Egypt, uh, that's that same mistress of the beasts and the same goddess of uh, life and procreation that also is linked to Hestia at the same time. And the extraordinary workmanship uh, tells us essentially that even though they were a nomadic society, uh, there is no question that, that craftsmanship existed. Of course, by the time they got to the Black Sea, the Greeks were there and many Greeks, uh, uh, many objects were made for them by the Greeks. Uh, and speaking of the goddesses, uh, the female goddesses, uh, it also appears uh, in the Scythian society that it was a very equal society in terms of male-female relationships. And uh, many women were uh, horsewomen and they were warriors. Uh, a number of tumuli, in fact, are the burials of women warriors who are buried with their horses and with their attendants and with their armor. And it is very, very likely that the whole idea of the Amazons, the Greek Amazons, the Greek got it from the Scythians. Um, the Greek myth of the Amazons uh, talks about a race of barbarian warrior women. And here is an anonymous uh, Greek writer. Well, he is called, as I said, a pseudo-Hippocrates. And this is what he has to say about these women. The women mount on horseback, use the bow, and throw the javelin from their horses. They fight with their enemies as long as they are virgins. And they do not lay aside their virginity until they killed at least three of their enemy and not only killed them but presented the skulls because that was important as well. Nor have uh, they any connection with men until they perform the sacrifices 
according to law. Whoever takes to herself a husband gives up riding on horseback, and here's the caveat, unless the necessity of a general expedition obliges her. But the fact is, there was always a necessity of a general expedition. So the whole idea of being a virgin, perhaps in the early stages of uh, her soldierhood, but uh, because there were, there were always wars and there were always military bands, uh, it seems that women continued to do so even after they were married. They have no, and it is from him that we get the idea that they had no right breast where the word for Amazon comes from, because Maso is a breast uh, mastectomy, today's mastectomy, the, um, the surgery on, uh, on the breasts are, ah, Mazon is without, without a breast. And here he says, they have no right breast, for while still of a tender age, their mothers heat strongly a copper instrument constructed for this very purpose and apply it to the right breast, which is burnt up and its development being arrested all the strength and fullness are determined to the right shoulder and the arm. So that's where the Greeks got the uh, word for the Amazon, as I said. Um, here you see the image of a Scythian, a uh, female warrior. Scythians in general were known uh, by these pointed, uh, pointed heads. And we see these hats uh, in the... Uh, depictions uh, of Persian victims of war, for instance, or the conquered people, and a number of them are Scythians, and we know them by these pointed heads. Here is uh, a burial of one such woman, uh, and uh, Adrian Mayer uh, wrote the book on the Amazons, if you're interested, Lives and Legends of uh, uh, Warrior Women, and here she says that about one-third of Scythian women whose remains have been found, um, were buried with weapons when they were warriors, and many sported war wounds. And here is uh, one such burial, as you can see, and it is reconstructed. This is the artist rendering, uh, seen with a beautiful um, sort of a crown, a headgear in this case. And Amazons completely captured Greek imagination, particularly in view that the Greek society was a very, very uh, male-oriented society. For the most part, women uh, were uh, consigned to a, a female part of the house called gynecums, uh, and uh, they had no rights. They couldn't even go out without being accompanied by a man of the house, and they were given no education. So, uh, and for a Greek man, the war was definitely a prerogative of a male. So the whole idea of an Amazon fascinated them tremendously, and so it did the Romans uh, later on. But it appears that these were actually real women and uh, that they belonged to these uh, nomadic uh, tribes. It appears that uh, there was gender fluidity among the Scythians. Here's Herodotus who is talking about a myth, and that myth has to do with a band of Scythians among those warriors uh, who uh, descended into Palestine and reached Egypt, and that on the way, it appears, that they looted, that they pillaged a temple of Aphrodite in Ashkelon. And so unhappy was the goddess that she decreed that these men who looted the temple and all their descendants will from now on be gender fluid. And as a result, uh, they would have the strong feminine impulses. Now, they were known, now this is the myth, about looting of the temple. But uh, the other portion that a number of Scythians were in fact gender fluid is not a myth. And they are known, they were known to the Greeks as uh, Enarius. Um, now, Pseudo Hippocrates, with his medical bent, uh, gives a more rational explanation rather than mythology, whereby the Enarii were impotent as a result of continuous horseback riding. Especially, essentially, it was beaten out of them. And, uh, and this was the reason why they adopted feminine roles in many cases. But even Hippocrates, too, also underlined uh, that only the noble and powerful men could be in Ari because they were the ones who, uh, who were horseback riding. They got to ride the horses.
Some of these uh, men uh, became the shamans with the presumed gift of divination because by uh, being different they immediately were presumed to have other powers and uh, Scythian shamanism involved religious ecstasy through the use of cannabis uh, and because they had no temples and no altars they would construct a special inhalation tent uh, essentially in which they uh, uh, they would uh, throw seeds of cannabis on red coals and inhale the fumes and became very happy thereupon. Um, and yes, both these uh, coals and the seeds were found uh, in multiple uh, in multiple kurgans, in multiple tombs. Uh, now this is the, here's the detail of the hairdress. This one, just sort of like the hairdress we saw on a woman. Uh, who was found in one of the kurgans and showing a goddess in the center uh, or a chief priestess and she's surrounded by other priestesses and it seems to be uh, it seems uh, to have one of the inari on the right here in fact when you look at this image here and this is detail from a wall hanging uh, and this wall hanging comes from Siberia from southern Siberia and the only reason the organic meta survived in those regions is because these kurgans uh, are located in the permafrost zone. So organic meta was frozen. And as a result, we have something like these hangings. We have things that are made of organic materials. Uh, we have weavings. We even have skin. Uh, both we have a male and a female skin with tattoos. I'll show you those as well, um, which is of course extraordinary and of great help because the Kurgans in the Ukraine and uh, southern Russia, uh, everything that's organic pretty much disappeared. Uh, well, some bones remain, but in Siberia, in southern Siberia, because of the permafrost, these things in fact uh, survive. And uh, here is one of the hangings. Here the seated goddess grasps the tree of life here and then the elegant sutra is coming up to her. Now the reason I'm showing this is because uh, uh, Barry Gunleaf who wrote the book and who is the foremost uh, specialist on uh, Scythian archaeology and Scythian culture and the book is absolutely brilliant. I'll show you the book later on. These are his uh, notes and but when you look at this goddess, the face looks very masculine, actually. There's no hair. Yes, there is a headdress, but this headdress could very easily uh, be on a man. And uh, tree of life, perhaps, uh, or perhaps cannabis plant, also possible. But there's a, a definite sign here of gender fluidity that, uh, that I see. This man here, he's an elegant suitor. Uh, uh, Professor Gonliff uh, writes, wearing his goritos, and he approaches from the front. Here's the goritos, and what goritos is, right here you see it today, it's a bow and arrow case, essentially. It's a combination of a bow case and a quiver in one. So it's not just for the arrows, it's also for the bow. And we'll talk presently about it. Meanwhile, here's from Herodotus about cannabis. The Scythians take cannabis seed, creep in under the felts, and throw it on the red-hot stones. It smolders and sends up such billows of steam smoke that no Greek vapor bath can surpass it. The Scythians howl with joy in these vapor baths, which serve them instead of bathing, for they never wash their bodies with water. Well, that's according to Herodotus. Until the archaeology, the, uh, the Kurgan archaeology, began in earnest in the 19th, 20th century, uh, so many things that Herodotus said uh, sounded very unlikely and uh, just sounded fantastical. However, with the, with the advance of archaeology, most of what uh, he talks about actually was proven to be correct, so perhaps this was correct as well. And uh, speaking of uh, organic matter, these are the tattoos that the Scythians practiced. Um, in combination of full body tattoos, you may imagine that this gave the Scythian an extremely frightening look. Uh, and being famous as extraordinary warriors in the first place, they, uh, they would 
terrify the enemy. Now, the mummified remains belong to the members of the southern Siberian tribe and um, originating in the Iron Age, which comes in the first millennium. The researchers speculate that the nomadic tribe used the tattoos for perhaps personal identification, possibly so that others could identify them being from specific tribe. Uh, or perhaps gods might identify them in afterlife, also possible. The intricacy and the details are stunning and actually mystifying considering the lack of technology. Here they are, you can see them, and they represent a lot of animal life, as is extremely important with the Scythians. Uh, here is an artist recreation of a Scythian uh, warrior with tattoos right here. Uh, as you see, they very much believed in ornamentation. All these objects that you're looking at came from the uh, grave sites and uh, are attested by the archaeologists. Here's some more. Uh, these are the tribes from uh, perhaps southern Siberia. Herodotus describes uh, these men and women as having red hair and blue eyes. Um, so, as I said, uh, he encountered the Scythians in today's Ukraine and southern Russia and only knew about the Siberian Scythians uh, by, uh, by hearsay. But, as I said, the, much of what he had said was uh, very accurate. But, um, again, these are nomadic tribes. Some went west, some went east, uh, some intermingled with uh, perhaps Mongolian tribes, others uh, came west intermingled with the Slavic tribes, and that's why these artist recreations show uh, sort of red-haired men uh, with blue eyes. And they were pastoral tribes, so they did have um, these uh, sheep and, and cattle and what have you. Here's another recreation, um, and this is now from Crimea, uh, from uh, Kurgan the Crimea, and here's a Scythian stringing the bow. Now, we'll talk about a Scythian bow, which was incredibly sophisticated and was not easy to string it. But here it appears on, uh, on a vessel from one of the Kurgans, and there's the artist's uh, recreation of uh, how these were strung. I mean, the, the man put the thing under his knee to help uh, tighten, uh, tighten the string. Uh, by the way, uh, these are stone monuments the Scythians also produced. Some of them were sort of like grave markers and they came uh, in the shape of just um, uh, plain stone markers or in the shape of uh, women, men, what have you, and they were often found on top of the of the tumuli, of the kurgans. Here's the Scythian bow and it was the most advanced bow that uh, uh, that was known at the time. It's a composite bow made of wood, horn, and sinew, and then all of it glued together. Image below shows part of the wood and horn core laid out before assembly and the application of sinew, because people today are fascinated by these techniques as well. So this is a modern recreation, this is a, a modern schematic. This layout, produced by Jason Beaver, you may look him up, gives an idea of the complexity of these bows. And here's the man himself by the name of Jason Beaver, uh, and he is here at full draw. These bows could go for one-third of a mile um, in the arrow once it was shot by a skillful bowman, could go half a kilometer. Uh, his tattoos, Mr. Beaver's tattoos, are a faith by faithful copies of the tattoos that were found on the preserved bodies. Today's uh, archers uh, find this fascinating because uh, um, the Scythians really were uh, incomparable arches, and uh, the Parthians, the later Parthians, it's very possible that they learned their archery from the Scythians. Uh, here is Barry um, Kahnleif, the one they told you about, and here's the book, and much of this lecture uh, refers back to that book. Uh, and this is from his book also the description of how the bow was strung. This is the unstrung bow right here, then it goes backwards as you see here, and then this is the bow at the draw. Uh, the bow was made from strips of wood and bone glued together. Um, when strong and act requiring skill and strength, it was under much tension, impairing great power to the arrow. As I said, 
it could go for half a kilometer. And uh, we know the expression the Parthian shot. And the Parthian shot today is used generically. You, you find it in literature, and today it's meant as the last word, essentially. The, uh, before he left, uh, he gave them the Parthian shot. In other words, he annihilated his audience with a brilliant remark. So today, as I said, it's called the Parthian shot. In today's lingo, it would be a mic drop, something like that. But the origin is here. And as I said, the Parthians, which were also an Iranic people, part of the Persian Empire, it's the shot that's done backwards. In other words, the Scythians preferred not to, to meet their enemy in a frontal battle. They would rather uh, pretend to retreat uh, because they had nothing to defend. But in this pretense, they would turn around and unexpectedly send a forest of arrows at, uh, at their enemy. And that required an amazing skill because there were no stirrups at that time. The stirrups will not appear until maybe second century BC. But uh, so everything, the control of the horse was entirely in their knees and in their legs. So they had to control the horse while riding forward, while their body was turned backwards and while they were shooting at an enemy. An ancient military tactic where archers on horses would feign retreat and then turn their bodies while in full gallop to shoot at the pursuing um, enemy. Uh, here it is, again, an artist recreation. It seems that uh, some of them even mastered the ability to shoot from behind uh, your head, as it is shown right here. So that's just the pinnacle of a Parthian, or, or Parthian shot. There seems also to be a phenomenon of blood brotherhood among the Scythians, because we have uh, uh, this golden plaque, which is uh, very interesting. Uh, the Blood Brotherhood, which is a creation of uh, a sacred and unbreakable bond between uh, the warriors. Now, whether the Scythian Brotherhood was anything similar to the sacred band of Thebes is unclear. And the sacred band of Thebes here, I'm just telling you, it was a troop of selected soldiers um, consisting of 150 pairs of male lovers and uh, they were virtually unconquerable. They will be conquered by uh, Alexander's father, Philip of Macedonia, in the 4th century BC, but it was a very powerful force. And uh, who knows? We, Herodotus doesn't write about it, um, but we do have uh, this and similar other expressions in the Scythian art that show something similar uh, to do that. And I, I keep talking about the so-called kurgan or tumulus or tomb and this is what they looked like. So when uh, particularly when the king or an, uh, an aristocrat, an important aristocrat died, then this tomb uh, would be constructed as you see here. Um, they had the human sacrifice because when he died that aristocrat um, best horses would then be killed and buried with him as well as one of his wives or concubines and uh, various servants. All these people would be uh, smothered and would uh, be buried with the king. Uh, Herodotus also uh, writes uh, an astonishing story that was in fact supported by archaeology and that is after a year, after a year passes, after the burial, presumably something happens to the spirit of the dead man, the spirit may still be attached to the dead man, but after the year uh, passes, the spirit is ready to depart, and in which case the tribe travels back to the Kurgan, to the tumulus, and 50 of the best horses are put to death, as well as 50 of the best retainers of that man. And then these retainers are placed on these horses and all of that attached to the earth with poles and they form an honor guard around the tomb. And it seems that these, uh, the remains of these horses and men have been found. And here it is. Uh, 
If you like, you can read the whole description. And uh, here's the site uh, that I'm giving you where this whole thing is described. But it seems that that was part of the uh, funerary rites. And the site is called <laughs> Creepy Scythian Graves. Uh, and now, uh, last but not least, uh, we are going to talk about Scythian art. I mean, we've seen very many examples of extraordinary Scythian art. But uh, a lot of that art is dedicated to representation of animals and a very succinct, uh, very schematic, uh, very, very modern to our eyes representation of animals. A lot of them are done in gold, a lot of them done in silver, but a lot of them are done in gold. And gold, I looked it up actually, and uh, gold came from the mountains uh, of Russia and it was brought down uh, by the rivers, uh, the mountains, the uh, would erode, created alluvial gold deposits in the rivers that were flowing into the Black Sea. And then the gold was panned, just as it, uh, it's done very much today. And, um, or the river, river sand, uh, dirt would be diverted through sluices, uh, and gold would be collected in sheep's skins. And that's where it gets fascinating, because this may be the origin of the Golden Fleece. Because in order to find the Golden Fleece, the Argonauts, which is another epic in Greek mythology, went to the Black Sea, went to the Caucasian Mountains. That's where Tavrida is, and that's where uh, lived the Golden Fleece. And it's possible that uh, this collecting of gold in sheep's skins uh, was the origin of the Golden Fleece from the Argonauts story. Uh, because they very likely uh, sifted gold the same way as I've just um, described. Here's the deer-shaped gold plaque. It comes from the Kuban region in southern Russia in the, um, in, the, uh, in the area just before the Caucasus Mountains. Uh, and this is from the 7th century BC. So this is very considerable. Um, here, uh, another one from the 4th century. I mean, the interest in decoration, their interest in uh, the animal world never slackened. They ornamented their bodies, their clothing, their horses with just riots of curling, swirling, twisting, and fighting animals. There are recumbent deer, as you see it here. We will see coiled felines, winged griffins, uh, here they are, right here, uh, and birds of prey. Uh, there are predators who are tearing at uh, sheep, deer, or horses, a lot of them tearing at horses. Sometimes predators fighting each other. Uh, there are human hunters in action, running down and spearing ferocious wild beasts. Whether lifelike lions or mythical horned felines. They, these, images, these images seem to reflect the life of the people. The life was a constant strife. And the animal world was always around them, whether they were in Siberia or in the steppes of Kazakhstan or in the southern slopes of the Caucasus Mountains or in Crimea. The animal world was always there. And they watched uh, the fight for survival. And they watched the survival of the fittest. And they were a part of that animal world. Um, is it possible that certain beasts personified certain tribes? Very possible. Is it possible that certain beasts personified certain people? Also possible. These images seem to blur into depictions of war, where a human fights human as if battling beasts should be read as metaphors for battling people. Because, as I said, we see it everywhere. In this uh, pictorial, for instance, the middle of the pictorial is occupied again with trellises, but then the upper part of the pictorial shows peaceful life, and I'll show you the uh, close-ups. On the other hand, the lower part of the pictorial is a fight for existence. This is done in gold. It is 4th century BC, and uh, it comes, it, it's in the Kiev Museum of Historical Treasures. It, it comes from uh, today's Ukraine area. It's possible done by the Greeks, because this definitely is Scythian workmanship. And you can see the, uh, the, the very unadorned, very powerful planes. Everything is reduced to action. Everything is reduced to the most important uh, elements of animal survival. 
is he recumbent or is he in flat? Uh, this extraordinary mane of horns on his head, is that a tree of life as well? We don't know. We can only wonder and marvel at this. Also, the sound explanation for this very plain, uh, very modern forms perhaps comes from woodworking because these things undoubtedly were done in wood at first. And in wood, the uh, plain surfaces are a very uh, natural occurrence. Whereas something that intricate perhaps was done by the Greeks for the um, uh, Scythian chieftains. So now here's the upper area and uh, there's a boy with uh, an amphora. There's a baby suckling the cow. Perhaps the boy will uh, collect some of the milk in his amphora. Uh, there is no attention to scale. Obviously the boy is presented in a much larger scale than the cow. Uh, here is the horse that is in some interaction with the cow. Uh, more of the same. Here's two men who are dividing a ship's skin right here or treating a ship's skin. Here's a little foal that's uh, suckling the mother horse here. Here's the boy, that same boy of ours who is milking a sheep. So as you see, the upper area is all just dedicated to peaceful pursuits. Not so the lower area. And here you see two winged griffins devouring a horse right here. And the entire lower part of, uh, of the pictorial uh, is dedicated to, uh, uh, to fight for life, essentially. So, as you see, the upper area is dedicated to peaceful pursuits, while the lower area is dedicated to the fight for life. Uh, you see here just a part of it, but here is the entire lower part. Here's the lion devouring a pig, it seems. Uh, here's another griffin. Here's two griffins. These are our griffins. Here's another pair of griffins. Same here and same there. And there are the dogs, the hunting dogs. Apparently Scythians did have hunting dogs. Here is another item. It's a bowl and I'm showing it to you from both sides. And on the one side you see a lion with, and the two horses are clearly hunting a lion with spears. The lion broke one of the spears here and uh, the hunting dogs here as well. And in this case, again, some sort of a horned feline that is attacking one of the um, one of the riders. Also, perhaps done by the Greeks because the anatomy, uh, the figure of the um, uh, of the rider, and the anatomy of a horse and the lions is done with a great degree of detail. This is what the uh, kurgan actually one of the kurgans looked like uh, uh, back a hundred years ago. Here it is with somebody standing on top. And this is, uh, this is the process of excavations of these uh, kurgans. Uh, one of the most spectacular uh, finds is this comb. And uh, uh, also probably done by the Greeks. Uh, and the central occupant here, this writer, is wearing a Greek, uh, Greek helmet. He also wears greaves on his legs right there. And what appears to be a Greek armor. Uh, and it's interesting that the principal occupant in that grave uh, had these items buried with him. So it's uh, very possible that we are watching a scene from, uh, from his life right here. Uh, this is slightly more dramatic uh, photograph. He is fighting uh, a man in a Scythian hat, as you see here. This man's horse had fallen down right here. So he's now fighting on foot. He's fighting this man. And here, this man is not alone. He has a helper here, but it seems as if it's the Scythians fighting each other or different tribes perhaps fighting one another because they're all wearing trousers. Scythians did wear trousers. The man here, even though he's wearing greaves, he still is wearing trousers. Um, the scale, again, is different for horse and man, and that will, in fact, be uh, something that the Greeks will do, uh, apply different, uh, different scale to horse and man. Uh, still another of these uh, extraordinary animal plaques and it shows a griffin, a lion, again attacking a horse right here and this comes from the 5th, 4th century. Well it does have some detail but not nearly as much detail 
as this, for instance, does. So this may have been done by Scythian uh, craftsmen as well, because it has this um, economy of detail that is uh, very characteristic of the Scythians themselves. Uh, still another brilliant piece, uh, and this is a panther. Uh, what's interesting in this panther, this is done by the Scythians, that uh, the baby panthers seem to be uh, uh, embedded into the, uh, the mother's body. And uh, does this uh, convey the idea of the mother panther defending uh, the little ones, uh, the defending the kittens, because uh, uh, she certainly appears as if ready to attack and even in the pose of, uh, of readiness. Uh, again, this paucity of detail, this uh, almost abstract uh, quality of economy that is applied to this uh, plaque is, um, is very pleasing to modernize, of course. Still another one, uh, again from the Hermitage, uh, and in this case this is a coiled uh, panther, also a panther, also a feline. No babies in this case, but uh, the, uh, the round shape, that of the universe, uh, perhaps, it, obviously they were observant as they traveled this sea of grass that um, the sun uh, rose uh, in the east and uh, went down in the west. Uh, so the, the, the whole perfect idea of a circle is here represented as well. Um, and thus we are at an end, pretty much, uh, we returned to one of the first slides just to show you that, um, that the Scythians, as I said in the beginning, the Scythians span this incredible territory from uh, southern Siberia into the Hungarian plain in uh, Central Europe. And uh, as, I, as I said, there are clues about uh, the ritual practices in the reports of the, of the Greek ethnographers and the artifacts that are uh, found in the tombs and perhaps uh, some of them uh, testify to the belief systems also conveyed in the animal art that uh, Scythians carried with them from Siberia uh, into Europe, from the edge of Mongolia into, into Central Europe. And um, uh, the writer, uh, Barry Conliff, uh, also postulates that right here he calls this uh, a middle Danubian interface, because this is the river Danube, right here. It goes right there, the middle, and in the middle da uh, Danubian interface, this is where the skiffs met the Celts, because here, are, here is the Hallstatt culture and the Tene culture around uh, in the middle of Switzerland. And this is where the Celtic tribes and the Scythian tribes came, came together. And uh, it's possible that the Scythian culture influenced the Celtic culture. And if this is true, a cultural continuum may in fact be traced, well, from southern Siberia to Britain, to Scotland, to Ireland, uh, a continuum across thousands of miles and several centuries. And all of that represented by these incredibly dynamic forces of um, animal representation. And the evidence is compelling. Uh, because the similarities in the so-called animal art will be then seen in Celtic art of uh, 4th, 3rd, 2nd century BC, and then into the first millennium it will be seen in the Germanic tribes uh, that populated the northern forests right here, and of course the Germanic tribes here, the Goths, then will descend to the Black Sea area as well and intermingle with the Scythians. So it's all quite fascinating. Thank you very much. I'll see you in class.